Hallelujah. One of the things I want to talk about tonight is called humility. Humility. Glory to God. Humility. A requirement from the Lord. Humility. You know, I hear a lot of people say, Oh, you, I come to you, Lord, as your humble servant. <laughs> I want to say, be quiet, will you? <laughs> we don't have to tell God that we come to him as his humble servant. He knows whether you're humble or not. Amen? <laughs> the word humility means state of being humble or the absence of pride. <laughs> It is the state of being humble or the absence of pride. It is required by the King of Glory that we maintain humility. That's how you maintain your walk. No humility, no walk. Psalm 25. Glory to God. Psalm 25, 8 through 15, and let's read it together. Is everybody there? Praise God. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he teaches sinners in the way the humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Wow, there's a lot of reward in humility, isn't there? Humble, he'll guide you. He'll teach you. You know, reverence or fear of the Lord, which is the same thing, is a, few, is a fruit of humility. The reverence, which is a representation of the fear of the Lord, one of the uh, is a fruit of humility. Of course, it's the act of being humble, isn't it? So we see that there are a lot of rewards and attributes to this. It says He'll teach us, He'll guide us, He'll well, He'll grant us mercy, He'll maintain His covenant with us. It will be passed on to our, to our children. <clears throat> and it says, The secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him. In other words, God reveals hidden secrets to an individual that's humble before Him. Those are revelations that the Lord shares with an individual. That's why it's called the secret place of the Most High. It's a secret place between you and God. It's a covering under His wings. It's a covering under the blood. It's a place where you and daddy are. Amen? And it says the eyes are toward us and those who are humble. And he'll snare the enemy in his own trap and remove us from the net. So I understand humility is an act of being humble and is an essential character for the Lord himself was humble. Amen? Let's go to 1 Peter 5. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 5. Verse 5. 
Let's read it together, okay? Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So you know what? Grace is a representation of favor, isn't it? It says that it resists the proud, but he gives favor to the humble. So he utilizes here that one of the ways of being humble is by submission. Submission. In verse 6, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now understand something. If you can't humble yourself under the authority or be submissive under the authority that God has given you, there's no way you can be submissive under the authority of the hand of God. Because if you can't be submissive to tangible things that you see, how are you going to be submissive to one you don't? Amen? So he says, listen, if you'll humble yourself before God, he's going to exalt you in due time. You will be rewarded. In verse 7, he says, casting all your care upon him for what? He cares for you. You know, many times we keep trying to, of course, answer our own prayers. Oh, Lord, I need this. Okay, I think I'll go do it. <laughs> and we answer our own prayers and don't even give God a break to do it, you know. So we, <laughs> we see here that we're to be casting all of our cares and concerns on him because he's the only one that can truly make the way. Amen. Not that he doesn't use man. Yes. But he's the only one that can make the way and use man. Amen. Amen. He's the only one. In verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, you know what? We've been hearing the scripture a lot, because it's not getting easier. It's getting harder. So he's looking for someone he can devour. What he's looking for is, you know, on that... Uh, and that radar detector of the demonic activity, they see the bleep going off, you know, like in, what do you call the air controller? <laughs> you know, they see that bleep going off pride. Boop, 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 and they're after it. Okay, let's go eat. And that's what they want to do. Remember, demons get fed off of your emotions. And then they access you. That's why people who argue and so forth, you ever notice that it gets worse? People who drink and smoke and whatever, there's an emotion involved. And they get fed off of emotions. In verse 9, it says, Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are expressed by your brotherhood in the world. So everybody's going through it. Nobody does not go through it. The only reason why people are not having a problem with demonic activity is because the demons are in them. Hello? Yeah. And they don't even realize it. Right. The word says that a devil will seek dry ground. Mm -hmm. Dry ground is a place of blindness. It's a place of blindness because it's dry. So where you're blinded at, the demonic activity has access to us. Does everybody get it? Where we're blinded at is where they have access. Why? Because it's a path of darkness, isn't it? So you and I must first submit to God, then resist the devil, and he'll flee. The problem is, is people do halfway submission, and they don't fight against the powers of darkness, and they expect Daddy to take care of it all, when he already did. But he said, I didn't come to bring you peace, I came to bring you a sword. Now you do the rest. Amen? Amen. And verse 10. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So he's requiring us to be clothed with humility, which brings favor, doesn't it? You and I have dominion over darkness. When we, when we come and we stay clothed in humility, what happens is he is perfecting us more and more in his image and likeness. 
He is positioning us. He has given us strength, and you will receive rest. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 16. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16 and verse 19. Now we'll start at 18. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is everybody there? Come on, read it with me. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Wow. You know, the devil likes to shoot those dark. <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry about it. God knows your heart. It's between you and God. What's he doing? Enticing you. And if you accept that thought as yours, then you go into captivity. Amen? It says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The reason why people fall and backslide is because of pride. Because they don't stay humble. I'm all right. We see a lot of men, because it's a men program here. We see a lot of men come in here to be here two or three months. I'm okay. The next thing I do, they're in my class in jail within usually a short period of time afterwards. Or they're miserable. They usually end up divorced, whatever, on the street, whatever it is. Because pride is a killer. In fact, pride is the number one killer of mankind. It causes sickness disease, poverty, despair, low self-esteem, it's the number one killer. Because once you allow pride in, you allow everything else. Amen? Amen? In verse 19, it says, Better to be a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. So he's telling us it's good to be humble. You know, one of the things that people have a hard time with is when they make a mistake, they don't want to admit it. Because of pride. And then what happens, it begins to build. And the next mistake is usually bigger. And then the guilt is so much torment because <laughs> they didn't make a confession and be honest. See, honesty is what releases guilt. Amen. Let's go to Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18, verse 12. Somewhere around there. <laughs> okay, is everybody there? Verse 12. It says, before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, and before honor is humility. So you've got to understand something. Pride produces destruction. Humility produces honor. That's real simple, isn't it? Pride produces destruction. Humility produces honor. Verse 13, I like this one. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. It's known as pride. Pride. The spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? The heart of the prudent acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. Praise God. So we need to be humble. We need to be cloaked in humility. Amen? Let's go to uh, Proverbs 24. So pride produces what? Destruction. And humility produces honor. Proverbs 24. Let's 
So what do you think denial is? Pride. Pride. <clears throat> denial is pride. You know, I remember when I was in denial, everybody else used to tell me I was a drug addict. I used to tell them, you're crazy. <laughs> everybody else knew what I was but me. <laughs> ah, get out of here. I'm all right. Another thousand dollars later. <laughs> not showing up at home. I'm all right. I'm not an addict. I'm just out partying. <laughs> Everybody parties. Everybody's demon possessed parties. <laughs> <laughs> 24 4. Well, let's start at verse 3. Through wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding it is established. Let me share something with you. Wisdom and knowledge come through humility. Because God does not reveal certain things to someone who is prideful, but He does reveal certain things to someone who is humble. And understanding and wisdom come through the Spirit. And let me tell you something. Pride will reject the Spirit. And we'll be doing the works in our own strength and not in the strength of the Lord. And the wisdom and understanding we think that we're getting is actually demonic. And it's not of the Spirit. Amen? Verse 4. By knowledge the rooms are filled with a precious with all precious and pleasant riches. Wow. The rooms are filled. What rooms? Your rooms. And what's the riches? Wisdom and knowledge of the ways of the Lord. Does everybody get it? That's riches. Because when you have him, you have everything. And then everything else follows. People are out chasing money. They're out chasing all kinds of things. Let me tell you something. When you have him, it chases you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57. Verse 15. Let's read this together, okay? For thus says the high and the lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Wow. Where does he dwell? Someone who has a contrite and humble spirit. Now look at, to what? Revive the spirit of you humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now a contrite spirit is one who remorses for having sinned. See, every day we sin, don't we? No matter what. There's a thought. There's a word. Something. Every day we sin. That's why we must repent every day. So you and I must have a contrite and humble spirit. We not, must not want to sin. And we must be quick to repent because we sin every day. We're sinners. Amen? And it says that he who... Um, has a humble and contrite spirit, the Lord, what? Dwells with him. Mm -hmm. So we need to get closer to the Lord by being humble. Go to Luke 18. Hallelujah.
Luke 18. You know, I remember when I was out there, and of course I would justify everything. You know, <laughs> that's the same thing as denial. <laughs> Justification and denial, they work hand in hand. <laughs> well, you know, the dog got hit by a car, so I really needed to, you know, you needed to make myself feel better, so I would use drugs. Well, th then they, the, the football team that I liked, you know, they didn't, they didn't win, so then I needed to use. And then, so justification is a representation truly of a hardened heart. Justification is a hardened heart. And a hardened heart shakes hands with pride. You know, when, when something's up, we must be willing to admit it because confession activates the blood of the Lamb and reconciles us back to God. The longer it takes someone to confess or repent, the further away he becomes with God and the more he'll reap. Luke 18 and verse 9. Also he, Jesus, spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Wow. <laughs> <Hello. Wow. laughs> they trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Ooh, that spirit of criticism loves to pop up. I'm all right, but everybody else is wrong. There's another handshake with pride. In verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and another a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I possess. Ay, 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 ay. I share with you that's a demonic pizza, isn't it? <laughs> And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. So we have a choice of what end we want to be on. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> Romans 12. We have that wonderful free will. Amen. Romans chapter 12. Everybody all right? Amen. Just a quick, simple teaching. Amen. Humility. Humility. Daddy honors humility. In verse 1 through 3. Let's read it together. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Let me tell you something. That's every morning. Every morning. Everything that God has blessed you with, you need to return to Him because it's His anyways. Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now we know that there's three wills of God. And we're not going to go into that. So we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. One of the things that happens is we, is we become humble and we stay in this humbleness. We see that the mind of Christ begins to manifest in us more. And as you begin to... Because the Word of God is what? It's the thoughts of God. That's what they are. The Word of God is the written thoughts of God. So as you and I read the Word, and how many people read the Word and still can't get it? How many people read the word and still can't walk it? That's why the letter kills. Because if you know it and can't walk it, it kills you. 
but the Spirit brings life. So without fellowship in the Holy Spirit, and without walking in the Spirit, and have fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit brings humility. You want to quench the Holy Spirit quickly? Watch what you speak. <laughs> want to quench the Holy Spirit quickly? Pride. He quenches them. Hallelujah. Is everybody there? Let's go on. Verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Verse 4. For we, are, we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we can't look at others. We must constantly look at the Lord and allow the reflection of what He is saying about us. You know how many times people say, man, you know what, this person, this person, that, you know, I'm telling you, it's just about this, and it's just, you know, what's God showing you? What's God showing you, not the other person? The only reason why somebody's offended is because they're not dead. Hello? Are you dead yet? <laughs> You know, when people come into the discipleship of us, what do we say? Welcome to the house of death. The drugs and alcohol are simple. It ain't nothing but demons. Amen. They go. But the dying to self. That's what hurts. That's the ripping of the old man. That's a ripping of those old desires. That's a ripping of the old mind. That's a ripping away. So the new mind and the new will and the new desires can be manifest in Christ. So you get a new wineskin. Amen? In James 4. James chapter 4. Glory to God. So, you know, you and I need to take dominion over haughty thoughts. And you know what else we must do? We must be willing to accept what has been dealt to us in correction. We must be willing to accept the chastening of the Lord. Does everybody get it? Because when we make a mistake and the Lord brings correction, we must be willing to accept it and do it and not buck at it. Because <laughs> rebellion is witchcraft, isn't it? In verse 1, 1 through 10, good one. Let's all read this together. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members. Remember, we share this. Freedom is a gift from God. Desires are bondages. Unless they're His desires. But all desires bring people into bondage. Unless they're the desires of the Lord. In verse 2. You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot attain. You fight in war Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures, adulterers, adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God, which means hatred? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but He gives more grace. Therefore, He says, God resists the proud, 
but gives grace to the humble. So pride is friendship with the world. In verse 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But, if we're not truly submitting to God in all areas, when we try to resist the devil, he laughs at you. Does everybody get it? So if you're not submitting to God and you're having a struggle... Because the devil, you don't have dominion. Dominion comes from God. Submit to God. Submit to his authority. Submit to what he's asked you to do. Submit to the Lord. Present your spirit, soul, and body to him every day. Go to him. Submit yourself to him. It says, cast all your cares upon him, right? Go to him. Let him establish it. Let him build the house. Let him do what needs to be done and receive the correction and counsel of the Lord. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Now, resisting the devil does not mean go, go away, devil. Now, I just submitted to God, devil. You got to flee. He's going to look at you like, you bonehead. You have to fight. The Bible says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Wrestling is a what? It's a fight. The powers of darkness, wickedness in heavenly places, right? So by resisting the devil doesn't mean that you're just going to say, okay, devil, in Jesus' name, do this. And it's going to happen. You must take dominion and authority. You must be bold. You cannot take no garbage from the devil. Or if you give him a hand, he'll take an arm. His purpose is to take ground. His purpose is to come back and repossess us because he calls us his home. Let's go on. Verse 8. Now he gives the conclusion. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Hello? Remember we just talked about in the beginning tonight about how important it is that the Lord is commanding his children to draw closer to him. It says, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Wow. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Ooh. Now we know we have a teaching on judging. We're supposed to judge fruits, right? God never said not to judge one another. He meant to judge the fruits. Because you don't want to be hanging around somewhere that ain't fruitful. Hallelujah. Desires bring bondage. Freedom is a gift. And everything is with a choice. Pridefulness is, the, is a friend with the world. And humility is a friend of God. Everybody got it? In Matthew 18. Humility is a friend of God and pride is a friend of the world. Glory to God. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 through 6. read this together okay at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying 
Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Sounds like competition. <laughs> Seems like we see a lot of that in the body of Christ. Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, As surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little child, you by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So we see that humility is great in the kingdom of heaven, isn't it? Now, don't misinterpret boldness for pride. Does everybody get that? There's a difference when the anointing of the Spirit of God gives you boldness to take dominion. Jesus had authority. It wasn't pride. Okay. In verse 5, whoever receives one of these little children like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Well, what, what kind of an example would hinder a, a baby in Christ? Pride. Pride would really hinder a baby in Christ. Because then he would think that he can get away with the things that an individual is doing. Amen. Humility brings greatness in the kingdom of God. Again, being a childlike doesn't mean you're a wimp. Doesn't mean that you're a welcome mat for the devil or other people. It means that you are bold, but you have boldness in Christ, not in your own strength. Amen? It's not pride. But humility is a representation of humbling yourself before the hand of God so that he can work through you. He's looking for empty vessels, dead vessels. Pride is life to the flesh. <laughs> Hallelujah. In Philippians 2. Philippians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 8. Oh, hallelujah. Welcome to Tuesday Night Live. <laughs> we there? Let's do it. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking a form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. Be like-minded. What's that mean? Christ-minded. Jesus humbled himself to the death. For what? For me and you. He humbled himself to death. <laughs> Hello? Jesus humbled himself to death. To God be the glory. <laughs> Turn to uh, Matthew 8. Matthew 8. Glory to God. In 
verse 1 through 4. Let's read it. When he, Jesus, had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, you've got to understand something. At that period of time, lepers just did not pop out of everywhere. In fact, if anybody saw lepers, they usually would curse them. They would tell them to get away. Some of them would even stone them to make them get away. This leopard walked out in faith and humbled himself, didn't care what people thought about him, didn't care what people were going to say, risked his life to go and worship at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus saw that humbleness. Does everybody understand that? And, he, and, and after he worshipped, he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He didn't ask beforehand. He worshipped him first. That was a sign of humbleness. In verse 3, Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. I mean, that is just, that is just so powerful to me and such a revelation. That humility is a representation of worship. Worship to Him. You know, I, I see a lot of believers say, yeah, I'm a believer. Yet they can't even praise God. It hurts my heart. Because they don't know. They don't know Him. You can read all about Him. And never meet Him. And you meet Him in worship. And that's where you meet Him. Hallelujah. So worship is a representation of being humble, isn't it? So you worship first and then you ask. <laughs> In John 13, that's why this is a worship and ministry. John 13, without worship, you ain't nothing. And the Bible says the Lord answers a worshiper but doesn't hear a prayer of a sinner Amen. <laughs> but we worship him because we have relationship with him and even when people don't have a relationship that good of a relationship with the Lord it, that relationship builds in worship John 13 1 through 9 <laughs> John 13, 1 through 9. Hallelujah. Let's read this together, please. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Jesus Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him. What did he do? He already put it in his heart. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, he was going home, rose from the supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. There was Peter again. At least, at least Jesus didn't say, get you behind me, Satan, you know. <laughs> and verse 9. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. 
And you are clean, but not all of you. Because he knew about who? Judas. Okay. Jesus set a, uh, an example of humility. you got to understand something. You know, in the first verse here, it says that he was getting ready to depart. You know? He was getting ready to go home. He was God. Can you imagine God taking the form of his own creation? He created something and chose to take the form of what he created. That's humbleness in itself. That's love. See, love and humility run together also. Love. He who has great love has great humility. Jesus set the example. I mean, you know, he basically stripped himself almost naked. But he wrapped a towel around himself. He said he laid his garments down. You know what he did? He laid his, who he was down. Because garments also represent authority or figure. He laid his garments down and he washed the disciples' feet uneducated men <laughs> just knew Jesus. Tax collector, fisherman made the choice to follow him. And there he was washing their feet. Three things happen in humility. Humility brings separation from this world into the real world the spiritual realm. Humility brings new garments. And it brings Christ-like service to others. Because others see Christ in you. You can't serve someone in pride, you serve them in humility. So it brings separation from this world into the real world and real relationships. It brings new garments. And of course, new garments is a representation of authority or position. And it brings Christ like service to others in humility. People see Christ in you. Amen? And Luke 7. Jesus, my Redeemer. And Luke chapter 7. Verse 36 through 38. Hopefully. Okay, let's read it. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed him with the fragrant oil. Now understand something then. This, now Jesus, first of all, washed the disciples' feet, didn't he? He was showing us an example about humility. There is a place of humility that brings us to the feet of Jesus. There's a place of humility that brings us to the feet of Jesus. Okay. This woman stood at the, his feet, wept at his feet, wiped his feet, kissed his feet, and anointed his feet. 
she was actually preparing him for his death. But she didn't know that he was preparing her for her death. Does everybody understand that? Deny, pick up, and follow. See, humility actually brings death and mortifies your flesh. She didn't know she was preparing him for his burial, but he was preparing her for hers. Denying self. Hallelujah. He was also preparing her for what? A new life. A new life. Humility brings new life. Where? At his feet. A place we need to go. Matthew 15. So we see that at his feet there's new life, isn't there? Matthew 15. Hallelujah. Matthew 15 and verse... Jesus departed from there. Is everybody there? And skirted the Sea of Galilee and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet and he healed them. Let me share something with you. There is healing at his feet. In Mark 5. And 22. Or 21. <laughs> All right. 21. Verse 21. Let's read it. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogues came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Now, he was a Pharisee, wasn't he? In verse 23, And he begged him earnestly, saying, My little girl lies at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and throgged him. Now, I want to share something with you. At the feet of Jesus is intercession for others. Does everybody get it? At the feet of Jesus is intercession for others. There's a difference between just intercession. We want answered intercession. And that's at his feet. Does everybody get it? So we see that at his feet is life, new life. At his feet there is healing. And at his feet, there's answered prayer of intercession, isn't there? Amen. But it all starts with humility. Mark 7. Mark 7. In 
verse 24. Hallelujah. Is everybody there? From Come on, read it with me. From there he arose and went to a region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, Isaiophysian by birth and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter but Jesus said to her let the child be filled first for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs and she answered and said to him yes Lord yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs and he said to her for this saying go your way the demon has gone out of your daughter. I'd say she humbled herself, didn't she, at his feet. And what happened? There's deliverance at the feet of Jesus. There is deliverance at the feet of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. This all started with humility, didn't it? Luke 10. Um, let's see here. In verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and what? Heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. What did she choose? To be at his feet. And what? Hear his word. Revelation word at his feet. Revelation knowledge. Revelation understanding. Come. And we talked about secrets. Secret, the hidden things, the secret hidden things are revealed to him who fears the Lord. Who reverences someone who's at his feet. That's where he gets it. Amen? Luke 8. Verse 26. Then they, is everybody with me? Let's read it together. Then they sailed to a country of the guardians, which is opposite of Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. 
When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demons into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons have entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine were feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would not permit them to enter them. And he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. They didn't even like them. When those who fed, <laughs> fed them saw what happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. I told you guys about those sports, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Whoa. Signing wonders at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. In Revelation 1. I wonder why the Jews didn't eat pig. Revelation chapter 1. Praise be to God. And verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in the book, and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesia, Samaria, Pergamos, Tyra, uh, Thyrotyra, Sardius, to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. And his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his hand on his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. At his feet is death to self. At his feet is death to self. And we're going to end with this scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 6.
verse 1. Let's read it. We then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumblets, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fasting, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, and as deceivers and yet true, as an unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things in humility. Humility. Character of the king. Let us be cloaked and clothed with humility. Humble yourself by the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due season. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that the seed that be imparted in us be kept by the blood of Jesus and it would grow and bear fruit for your glory. Lord, no man be glorified here but you. We thank you. We honor you. We bless you. We glorify you. We worship you. And we surrender to you. Bring us to your feet, Father, that we may know you and behold your glory. In all things, in Jesus' name.